Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, now applying some of the things we have been talking about for the general uh, uh, linear advection equation, mostly to the order equation. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the equations, and then I'm going to show you how to solve them with sort of the fairly standard methods. And then we'll talk a little bit about sort of how to do some of the more modern methods uh, when we get there uh, to uh, on one day, okay? So, uh, we're going to start with the Euler equation in one dimension, okay? and we now have a much more complex equation than, than, than we have when we solved the, the uh, navier stokes equation because we really had to solve the energy equation as well. Uh, on the other hand, there is you know, there just a vection equation. Basically, the uh, compressible flow is simply a hyperbolic problem, where, of course, the navier stokes equation is a hyperbolic, parabolic, and elliptic problem. Okay? So in one sense, the Euler equations are simpler, but in other aspects, in other aspects, they're more complex. They're more complex primarily because they have this tendency to form shocks in this continuous solution. So uh, we start with the Euler equation in one dimension. So basically, um, so the first is conservation of mass. They're typically written in vector form like this. So the first is conservation of mass, basically saying the change in density is the differences in the fluxes of mass in and out of a control volume. Then we have the momentum equation, the one in the middle, which simply says that the change in momentum is momentum, difference in momentum that flows in and out of a control volume plus the pressure. Okay? So in the for the Euler equations, the momentum is very, very simple. It basically says that only forces on a particle are the pressure forces, okay? And the last equation is the energy equation. Again, it says basically that the change in energy is whatever flows in and out, and then you have the uh, flow work. Okay, so we're ignoring all uh, heat generation, you know, the transport of heat by you know, radiation conduction or anything like that. Uh, in multi-dimension, basically the first and the last equation are the same, and you replace the momentum equation by three equations, where the pressure is in the uh, the pressure term only survives for the uh, equation in the direction that the velocity is. So uh, the, elect the the total energy is the uh, internal energy plus the kinetic energy, and we define the enthalpy basically by adding uh, by adding the uh, specific volumes times the pressure. And uh, we are going to, so those equations are general, and we are going, but we are going to spe specify or limit ourselves to ideal gas, which you remember from thermodynamics, as we assume, PV is equal to RT, and we are simply going to work with a gas constant in, in uh, sort of, uh, engineering variables. You remember that, so the R now is, is different for different gases. Uh, you can write it in terms of molecular weight and the universal gas part, but in gas dynamics, we typically want to work with just the R. Now, the ideal gas also, you can show that the, that the internal energy is only a function of the temperature, okay? Therefore, uh, the enthalpy is also only a function of temperature, and that those two assumptions really are the ideal gas assumption. Basically, the PV equal to RT, and the, uh, the internal energy being a function only of temperature. Okay, so we specify the, the uh, specific heat, constant volume, compressive uh, uh, change in it energy with, with temperature, and especially uh, either constant pressure, change in the enthalpy. Okay, now um, you can show, and I'll show you on the next slide, that uh, the definition here specifies the relate the, that R, the gas constant, is the difference in the specific heats. We also define usually the gamma, which is the ratio, and I'll also show you the variety on gas, the pressure and energy are related. Uh, pressure, energy, and density are related in this way um, that I've written down there. So. Again, here are the equations, uh, and this is basically what I've already showed you. The, uh, you can immediately, by the definition simply of this one here, you can show that R must be equal to Cp minus, minus Cb, and you can similarly, you can take this definition and you can show that the pressure is given by this relationship with the density and energy. Um, I'm not going to go through the speed of sound, but you can easily show also that the uh, speed of sound is the ratio is the derivative of pressure with density at constant entropy, and that is given by gamma RT. And so if you use the uh, ideal gas equation, you can write that as gamma times P over rho, and of course, the speed of sound is the square root of time. Okay? So 
Those of you who have taken gas dynamics, of course, know this, I hope. Uh, but uh, we, we're going to use most of those in the process of what, what we do. We usually also need the isentropic relationship which relate, uh, which relate pressure and density for a process where there's no entropy generation. OK, now the key here is even though we're going to work with the Euler equations generally in conservative form, using the supplementary relationship there that I have written down, actually what you really need is the pressure, but you will find that knowing the speed of sound helps with, help, help with the time step. But if we want to do the analysis that we did for the system of equations um, for hyperbolic systems, you have to rewrite it in terms of uh, basically a non-conservative form. So if you expand the derivatives in the flux term, you can actually show that you can write this as a matrix A times the derivative of, of vector F there. Okay? And I've rewritten both the, the, uh, both the momentum and the energy in terms of the velocity and the pressure. So now you have an equation that looks just like a system of, of hyperbolic equations. And then I can find the characteristics simply by solving the determinants of the transport of A. Uh, and that gives me the eigenvalues. Okay? So if I do that, it's a relatively straightforward exercise. So I find the determinant of that, and I find by taking simply you know, multiply u minus lambda minus the determinant of the uh, submatrix. So I find that the uh, this has three solutions. <coughs> so this equation over there, I can either if I solve it, and, uh, of course. Uh, here is u minus lambda. If I solve that, so I find that lambda is equal to u, or lambda is equal to u plus minus c. Okay? So basically, information, as you probably know already, propagates either with the flow velocity. Okay? Obviously, if the flow particle flows from here to there, that's carrying information. Or it flows by the speed of sound, but you have to add or subtract the velocity of the flow. Okay? So if, if the flow is moving with the speed of sound, then obviously nothing goes up. Right. Okay, so these are the equations. Uh, the other important thing that we need from gas dynamics is we need the conditions that governs the um, governs speed of a shock. Okay, and again, I have to define uh, to derive the ranking Lugano conditions, and we have already done this for a single system. Uh, I simply go into a uh, into a frame of reference that is moving with the shock. That's S. It's the speed of the shock. And then I integrate across the shock, okay? And so again, if I integrate over the time derivative, basically that leaves me with uh, that leaves me with zero because as I shrink the domain volume, uh, that goes to zero. But the derivative terms, in principle, over this continuity can become infinitely large. So when I when I integrate those terms, I end up with the uh, ranking luminal conditions at the bottom, which says that the velocity of speed of the shock times the jump in the value there, what I've called f, is equal to the difference in the flux. Okay? So, I sorry? On the first, on the second. How do I get from here to here? Okay, I add this term because I want to move with the shock. So I basically transfer into a, into a frame of reference that is moving with the shock. Okay? Remember, we did this for a single equation from when we started to talk about hyperbolic equations. So it's exactly the same thing, uh, except we now do it for the shock, for the system of equation, for the other equations. OK. Um, so if I do it for these equations here, then basically I get three equations. I get uh, this one comes from the conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, and conservation of energy. Okay? And now I have given. Uh, shock, basically given a condition uh, on one side, then I can solve these equations for the jump in pressure, jump in velocity, and density. Okay, so uh, I'm going to use these equations now to sh provide your solution for the Riemann problem. Okay, and um, even though we usually don't do exactly the full problem, uh, it is important when you start looking at a solution that you know what the solution looks like. Okay. So basically, uh, the, uh, we're going to go through the shock tube problem. And I, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on it because um, when you solve the problem numerically, 
you need to understand what the solution means. Okay? Remember, yes. Uh, is the S a constant? Uh, it doesn't have. It's not constant if the shock moves into a state with has variable uh, conditions. Okay. But in general, if you have a constant state and a constant state, then the shock speed will be a constant. Okay. But if the shock, if you have a non-uniform state, so you have you know shock in a ball that varies in density, then the shock speed would uh, would would change. But when I integrate this over the shock, okay, then the shock speed basically uh, is instant. I get the instantaneous shock speed. Okay. So. Okay. So, you know, people have been doing shock tube problem for a long, long time. So typically, uh, this consists of a tube of a membrane of some sort. You rupture the membrane, and then you watch what happens to the uh, state behind the system. The state in either, either uh, chamber. Uh, when I um, many years ago, I took a sabbatical at Caltech, and they had on the on the top of the building there, they had a huge shock tube. Okay, and it, the you know there was a there was a metal usually the metal what separates the gases is a metal disc, and they rupture it. And when you see those things in people's laboratories. Uh, they're typically just a thin metal piece. I think we have one in Hesser. Okay. Uh, the one there, you know, consisted of what was probably half an inch thick metal disc. So it was a huge tube. And you know, I had an office in the building, and every time I fire it, you know, the building would shake a little bit. Okay. So anyway, so you know, you start with basically something on the right hand side and, and the high pressure on the left hand side. You rupture the disc, and then you watch what happens. Okay. So let me go first through it here, and then I will show you very quickly. So what happens when you rupture the disc is, of course, the high pressure side expands. Okay. So high side, high pressure side expands, and as it expands, then the boundary between the high pressure gas and the low pressure gas moves. Okay. That is called a contact discontinuity because often, for example, you could have one of the gases being hot, or it could even be of different gases. You could have helium or hydrogen or something like that. Okay. So the difference, the, the, as the high pressure side expands, basically the boundary between the, ori the original boundary moves downstream, okay? And that's called a contact. Okay? So this is the, called the contact line here. This basically must, both sides move with equal speed, and it's basically the uh, original gas that is expanding and pushing the gas in front of it. Okay? Now, as the gas does that, it, not, it compresses the gas in front. Okay, so it kicks on the gas in front, and that generates a shock. Okay, so basically, whatever is left down here doesn't know that anything has happened. Okay, so basically, you know, if you imagine a row of cars, they expand. You know, here is the front of the truck. The truck hits the car in front, and they hit the car in front of that, and that, that is the shock. Is sort of the furthest car that has been you know bumped down the, down the tube. Okay, so this is a shock here. So that's a dip change in state in the gas that was down here. Now, as this expands, uh, basically you relieve the pressure here, and it propagates upward. Uh, basically, the gas you know, it's called the expansion fan it expands, and uh, eventually it reaches in, in here. Okay. So if you think of this as sort of a water problem, for example, you think of this as a as a tank with high water, and you remove sort of a gate here. Then the analogy is basically you see the water slump down back here, but it takes a little while for it to reach the upstream. <coughs> okay? We're going to do this problem then. Or no more. What's the velocity of these waves? Yeah, I mean, what are the contact? Okay, we're going to talk about the exact velocity in just a moment. So, okay, so, so say it again. What is the contact? Yeah, I was thinking only half shock or expansion. Okay, so the shock is the shock is pressure difference. Is the pressure difference? When this gas here, so so what happens is that the gas upstream expands. Okay, so it's a it's a complicated process because initially I have a disc here. I separate those two chambers. Okay, I remove the separator. Okay, so the color is going to be indicate the density. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And uh, that one is indicate the pressure difference. So the pressure wave and the density wave. Different velocities. Okay. Okay. That's, that's, that's okay. 
So I'm going to show you this in just a moment, but the, the point of this is that this is a fairly complicated process. You know, it's a, it's a physics that, physical um, process that involves you know, shock, which is a difference in pressure, contact, which is usually a difference in density, and gradual expansion in the initially high pressure gas, uh, and then uh, you know the left and right state will only will only be affected when uh, after a certain time. Now the important thing here is is that for the simple problem of constant state upstream and downstream, these lines are all straight, okay? Because there is nothing in the Euler equation that gives you a length or time scale, okay? So. Uh, and I'll show you that in just a minute, okay? So, if I look at the, if I plot the pressure and density, that looks like this, okay? So, the density, this is assuming this is the initial density, and this here is basically zero density down here, okay? So, the density of this gas is higher, so that moves downstream. There's no pressure difference between those two gases, so you don't see any, any contact with the pressure. The shock basically, uh, as this expands, it compresses the gas here, and here both the pressure and density jump over the shock. Okay, and then there's this gradual expansion, both in density and pressure, back to the left side. Uh, I'm not saying for, for that proper expansion, this is that the density and pressure are the same. They're the same. Pressure has been, I mean, at the front, yeah, the velocity is different on the pressure. For extension part, they're in the same decay rate. Oh, this is not to scale, okay? So so it's not, you're saying, no, see this one, you know, this one, for example, the way it is drawn is that this is a smaller fraction of this one here, and this is, you know, about a third of the original one. But that depends on the parameters of the problem. Okay. Okay, so um, the, we can actually solve this problem exactly. How many of you have taken gas dynamics? Compressible flows? Yes. Aerodynamics. It's not exactly aerodynamics. It's, well, it is aerodynamics, but it's usually called gas dynamics or compressible flows. Nobody wants to admit to having taken that? No? <laughs> In fluid mechanics, usually at the end of a fluid mechanics, there's a little bit about compressible flow. But I, if, that, if, if that's the last time you show it in undergraduate course, then I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to make you understand what's going on, okay? So ask, okay? After. It's very important that you sort of have an idea of what we mean by, you know, the shock, the contact, the expansion spans, the left, the right, and the right state. So it's worth spending a little bit of time on this problem. So ask if it is not clear. Everyone knows that's clear. Okay? We'll see the numerical solutions of a little bit later, so, but ask if it is not clear. Now, it turns out, as I was saying, that you can solve this problem exactly. I'm not going to go through the very details of that, but I'm going to try to suggest to you how it is done, okay? Uh, it's not terribly complicated. Any gas dynamics book will explain how it is done, but um, and, and I'm, going to try, I'm going to try to go over it with... I'm going to go, try to go over it so you see how it is done without actually doing it. So I'm going to look at this state. Uh, I know that the basically the separation between each region is a line that moves forward with time. Okay, And so I'll generally assume that there are two things given. I know the state to the left, and I know the state to the right. Okay, Because you know the state to the right is what I initially put in to the right. And then I typically will pressurize the state to the left until it has some uh, some known uh, properties. Generally, we will assume, or what follows, we're going to assume basically that the flow is at rest to the left and the right. And, but you can easily change that by simply adding a constant velocity. It changes that, you know. Okay. So we assume that we obviously we're going to assume that the pressure on the left is higher than the pressure on the right, because otherwise you don't get any shock. Okay. You know those, uh, as they will assume usually the velocity is zero. Uh, you know the uh, speed of sound, assuming this is a of gas. And just to remind you, we sometimes use this quantity alpha, but that's just for convenience. We could just write this down if we wanted to. 
Okay? So then I just sort of go through this process and uh, find equations how for, for that. Okay? So the first thing that I do is I apply the ranking Huguenot conditions to the shock. Okay? And remember, I don't know anything about what is behind the shock in region two. I only know what is on the right hand side. Okay? So it turns out that that allows me to solve for the ratio across the uh, of the pressure. So if I introduce this P here, then uh, I can derive this equation from the ranking order conditions, okay? Assuming that the velocity is zero. And this is a highly nonlinear equation for this ratio of the pressure across the shock. For those of you who have taken gas dynamics or compressible flow, if I don't want to admit it, uh, this is basically what is in the shock tables in the back of the book. Okay? So there were extensive tables in the back of the book. This is one of those things that are popular. Okay? Now, on the computer, you can obviously just solve this by iteration. Okay? So uh, this, this gives you a um, this gives you a relationship that allows you to solve the key given what is the ratio on the left, uh, given the pressure on the left, and the pressure on the right. Okay? So this will give you the uh, this will give you the pressure across the shock. Okay? Now once you have this, everything else sort of works falls out. Okay? You can derive uh, you can derive Again, from the ranking look at the conditions, you can derive the shock speed, S, okay? And once you know P, that is simply given by this equation here. And because the shock speed is simply a line, you know, just this equation here that shows, shows that the shock propagates uh, to the constant velocity, okay? Now, the speed of the contact, basically the velocity is the same across here, okay? Because there's nothing that happens and the conduct basically the one gas expands, it moves and pushes the other gas ahead. So the shock speed, the contact speed is basically uh, U3 and U2 are the same, and we can find U3 again from the ranking of the conditions. Okay, so that's this expression here. Okay? Now, the left hand side of the fan obviously moves simply with the speed of sound in here, which is the characteristics, and the right hand side here moves with the speed given by. Uh, Velocity, whatever velocity is there, because there's a finite velocity in region three and the speed of sound in region three. Okay. So I have basically now two slides where I sort of walk my way through this. Um, I'm not going to go through the equations in complete detail, but I'm just going to sort of tell you what they give you. But um, they are obtained simply by Walking through and matching everything once you know the state, the left and the right. So, in the left, there's a uniform state. Everything is known there because that's the same thing that was initial. In the expansion fan, um, it moves. So, along each line, but given given x and s, um, speed of the shock, basically the density is given by this, and this is going to vary. Okay, so that's why it depends on x. Okay, the uh, velocity is going to vary and the pressure is going to vary. So basically, this will vary. Okay? Behind the contact, on the, all, all other regions have constant properties. Okay? So it's only in the expansion fan where you have something like that. Behind the contact, again, the pressure is equal to pressure 2, velocity is equal to the velocity, uh, velocity uh, behind the shock, and the density, assuming the idea of gas, is simply given by this ratio here, where this P is the ratio uh, in front and behind the shock. Okay. So again, the, the values are given, and the next slide basically lists the other regions. Uh, there's an overlap. I repeat the, what I said about region three. Uh, the region again here behind the shock, and this is was originally as they gotten from the Huguenot condition, but now you know everything. Uh, again, the P is exactly the ratio between the P two and the right, so that's given by this, and velocity is again given by basically the ranking Huguenot conditions where we have worked in the pressures on the right and the left. Okay? And again, in the right universe state, everything is given, so that's relatively simple. Okay? So, 
the exact derivation of this, these equations is not terribly complicated, but given in any book of gas dynamics, you can work your way through sort of those. Now, in addition to the, um, the uh, conditions I've given here, usually we have to be concerned with the sound of speed. Okay? With this speed of sound is what I was trying to say. Okay? So, uh, it turns out that basically the flow regime will differ greatly whether you're in the subsonic or the sonic region, or su supersonic region. So when you compare the velocity to the speed of sound, we introduce the Mach number. And I'm pretty sure you remember from basic fluid mechanics. And obviously, if the Mach number is less than one, then it's subsonic. If your Mach number is bigger than one, then it's supersonic. Okay? So um, sometimes we work with the Mach number to work with equations in non-dimensional uh, form. The people have used this problem and simple variations on this problem to test numerical schemes for a very long time. Probably most of the, the most famous um, sort of uh, test case was published by Gary Schott in uh, JCP in the late 70s. So uh, he actually showed two cases. And these problems have become sort of standard test problems. If you have a, if you invent a new scheme, you have to do, do these problems. Okay? You can do others, but you have to do these. So, so he introduced two problems. Uh, there were uh, the subsonic case. So if you look carefully here at the Mach number, it's below 1. So the Mach number here reaches about 0.9 something. Okay? So he took basically, so he was working in essentially normalized variables, so he took density on the left equal to 1. So it's sort of close to atmospheric, but not exactly. Yes? Why do we still have a software when we can flow from one moment? Oh, you can still have it because there's a, okay, you can still have, um, you still have the um, characteristics basically coming together and forming a shock, okay? So relatively, the velocity actually before and after. If it is moving the frame of the reference to the <coughs> and the Mach number is bigger than one, it means there is a single vanishing Mach number in the reference. Good question. I'm trying to come up with a concise answer. So, uh, you know, if you are uh, shock. See, initially the velocity is zero on both sides, right? Okay, and uh, initially the velocity is zero. Why would you not have a shock? Because the is <laughs> lower, right? Okay. Uh, okay. So, so. So, in, okay, so this is really, I mean, the speed of sound is still finite, right? Okay, so when you remove the barrier, it still takes time for the information to propagate downstream, right? So you cannot possibly have, you cannot have the chamber knowing immediately that you remove the chamber, right? So information has to pass downstream, okay? And what happens is basically here, I mean, we call it a shock, but basically this is sort of the, the furthest, if you will, that the informations have made it, okay? I mean, it's still true that when you expand the gas, then as the upstream gas pushes on the downstream gas, it compresses the downstream gas, you know, and the, the pressure wave has to move downward uh, at a finite speed, right? Okay? So, so, and so there has to be an abrupt change from one to another. But I don't understand. <coughs> in the Mark table, we have M1 larger than 1 and M2 smaller than 1. And mm -hmm. in this case, when we uh, search the table, what do we get? No, when you search the table here, what you get is the pressure ratio, okay? So the pressure ratio gives you the jump of pressure across the, the, the shock, okay? Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Even under, and this is continuity, not only happening about the number one, but 
There are, in this solution, there are many discontinuities, okay? Right, the only, the only thing that's been referred to, you know, this is called the subsonic case because the Mach number just to reach one, and the other case is called supersonic because the Mach number turns over to one. But there's actually not a big difference in the solution. Oh, is that because after the shock wave, we have Mach number that's actually equals to zero? There's still a discontinuity. Okay. okay. I, I'm, I'm. Yeah. I think on the shock wave, and we construct the wrap, the frame of reference on the shock, and copy the. In that situation, we get math number. Yeah, this is not exactly the same as the shock table in the sense that you know we're solving the full problem here. The, the tables give you really the capital P given the conditions above and below, okay? Um, you know, as I say, this has been called subsonic and supersonic, but I, I, don't think it, I don't think it is really referencing the same thing that you are thinking about, okay? I'm, I'm, I think maybe it's because after the shock wave, here we have this mod number is zero. After the shock wave? Yeah. Well, okay, so the Mach number is zero only in the regions that have not been touched by the, that have not felt the shock yet. Yeah, I mean, in, if I remember correctly, within the Mach table, yeah. we don't have the case for the M2 equals zero in this case. I think maybe because this is uh, using the, uh, the cardio reference, is based on the shock wave, not the Oh, it, you're saying in the tables? Yeah, the paper, I think it, it's a, it's a coordinate, it's not using the shock wave. I use the, uh, you, you stand outside the shock wave and you see it. Now, this system maybe is, a, you know, it's based on the shock wave coordinate system. I think you're making it more complicated than it is. Yeah. It, it's clear that all of you have taken yeah. gas dynamics now. <laughs> okay. Um, let me, let me think a little bit about sort of the, the exact answer to the question. I, I think I know what the answer is, but I'm having a little bit of problems fully ex understanding the question and fully understand, fully appreciating how I can answer it, okay? So let me, um, let me try to come up with a good answer, okay? okay. okay? Because I, I, I want you to understand this and, and um, to tell you the truth, I've never gotten this question before, okay? So I haven't thought about it much. But. The main difference here is in what, what Barry did was basically he presented case with different uh, pressure upstream. So in this case here, you know, density is close to atmospheric, and pressure is close to atmospheric. It's about a bar uh, on this side, and then you lower the pressure on the other side. The uh, density is about one eighth. This is about ten times lesser pressure, and then we ran this. And initially, we started with zero velocity, and then we simply ran it. Okay. So this is actually the more benign problem. Uh, you will see that the jumps are actually not enormous. Okay, you can tell what the density is and so on. Uh, but the supersonic case, which is simply because a case where the velocities reach a higher Mach number, uh, actually is uh, a little bit more uh, challenging. Uh, this is the solution, the exact solution. And the point of this one is basically that once you have the solution, you can get to any other time by simply stretching it. Okay, because it's a completely, all the lines are straight, so it really is completely self-similar. Okay? Okay, so uh, here is the, here is the supersonic case, and it's supersonic basically because the Mach number uh, behind the shock reaches a uh, value larger than one. And you can see now that the density which is only you know one uh, basically one hundredth of the uh, original density, so this is a much lower density. The pressure ratios are similar, but the density is much lower. So the magnitude of all the uh, jumps tends to be quite a bit higher. But otherwise, the, the solution looks pretty much the same. So the density changes over the contacts with the expansion fan. Pressure changes over the shock, uh, and of course, velocity is a constant up to the expansion fan when it gradually goes to zero. 
and the Mach number is simply obtained by calculating the sound speed that you're lighting from, uh, by the velocity by that. Okay? So basically, the, here, the shock, here the um, velocity is constant and the speed of sound is constant, so you get this, but down here, the speed of, the speed of sound is different, and that's why you get a lower, lower velocity. So at the expansion part, the velocity of the linear degree. Sorry? At the, at the expansion part, the velocity is decreasing linear. Um, yes, I believe you've done that. Okay. Okay, so uh, I'm going to solve this. Uh, I'm going to solve this problem now in two ways. I'm going to solve them using very standard methods. And I'm going to show you both this, the uh, Landros and the upwind method and just sort of go through uh, how we do that. Okay, now, so when I do the lax Landros method, uh, the problem with that is that I have, I'm going to get oscillations. So I'm going to add this artificial viscosity, which we introduced some time ago, to the equation. So basically, I solve these equations, and then I add this term here to the right-hand side, where I do basically have a velocity. I don't actually add anything to the mass conservation. I have a one for the momentum, and then a scale it for the energy equation. I have this is h squared because I want this to go to zero as I refine the grid. Alpha has to be of order one, okay. And then, again, the density is there because we want to make sure this is all dimensional and consistent. Okay? So, remember the two-step lax wendroff scheme is consists first of doing what is called the lax frederick method, okay? which in itself is actually inconsistent uh, because it has an error like delta x over delta p. Um, but if you combine it with, if you follow it with a leapfrog, then it actually turns into a second order method. Okay? But we have added this artificial viscosity to the solution. Okay? So what you do is basically you use flats Vendro to calculate the intermediate points here, and then you use those fluxes here to leap over the middle to calculate the last one. Okay? So in many ways, this is one of the simplest way to solve the um, Euler equation. Because it is centered differences, there's no Riemann solver involved. It's relatively easy to program, but as you will see, you end up with uh, having to adjust the artificial viscosity. So, here's a solution. This is, I believe, the supersonic, subsonic case. Okay, and here I have used alpha equal to 0.5. You see that the this is the shock, and I have some oscillations behind it. Contact, I have some oscillations and I have some wiggles there for the, um, where I enter the expansion. Okay. So this is the density, uh, and you will see similar pictures when you look at pressure and other things. So. Okay, so the first thing to do is to um, look at effect of alpha, and you know you can't see it too well. But the point being here is that, um, you know, in this case, I think I have used alpha equal to 2.5. Uh, this is the pressure over there is the density. And you see, I sort of get rid of most of the oscillations. As I lower alpha, I have the red curve. Um, I do a little bit, little bit worse. Um, and typically, if I took alpha equal to 10, then the problem is I would smooth out everything, and just the shock wouldn't be very, very sharp. So the problem with the alpha, obviously, is I have to pick some alpha, but the artificial viscosity is designed in such a way that alpha of the order of one should be a good choice. If you increase alpha too much, or you actually run into that it starts to interfere with the stability of the problem, okay? So you uh, have to reduce the time steps because of diffusion limit. If I do different resolutions, you will find that I there I picked alpha equal to 0.5. You know, it starts to look pretty good. You get these little oscillations here at 256 grid uh, points, but you know, this is starting to look pretty close to the exact solution. You uh, sort of ignore the fact that there are oscillations. So, so if you pile in grid points, you know, it's not terribly complicated, okay? 
And as I say, this is probably one of the easiest ways to solve the problem. Um, it does require two steps. So all of the programs are about, you, know, you run over the time steps, you set the pressure, because we were solving for the energy. You know, here you define things at the half step. So you calculate the half step, you calculate the pressure at the half step, and then you do the leap block here. And what the way I have pro programmed this is that I simply then add the viscous blotches at the very end. So, the full program is, you know, more or less similar. Here is the full program. I'm not going to spend any real time going over it. But, you know, you, you just write out the equations. And uh, this is supposed to be written out basically in a way that is exactly like the way we write the equations. So it should be easy to see the correspondence, okay? And as I sort of try to catch up with where I am with the web, I'll make sure this program is somewhere there so you can download it. Okay, so the other method I was going to go through was first order upwinding. Okay, and the problem with upwinding, the problem with upwinding is that now you, for the system of equations, you have to decide how to deal with, you know, where the upwind direction is. Okay, one of the nice things with upwind when you have a single equation and you know the direction, is that it is very, very robust. I often said, you know, if, you, um, if you're having a problem with the code and, and you don't know where it is, you know, try solving it with an upwind because it will always give a solution. Not a terribly good solution, but it will give you a solution. So with a system of equation, on the other hand, you have to do uh, flux splitting. Uh, we talked about this again earlier, for, and we did this for the wave equation. So, the idea here is that you split the fluxes into fluxes that come from the left and the right. You do that basically by finding the eigenvalues so that F plus has the positive eigenvalues of this matrix, F has the minus, the negative uh, eigenvalues, and the total of those is the, is the, the uh, correct fluxes. For nonlinear equations, the problem tends or is that different matrices can have the same eigenvalues. Okay. So the goal is to get matrices that have, po po have positive and negative eigenvalues, but you can do that in basically the solution is non-unique. You know you can you can split the matrix up in different ways. Um, I'm going to show you an example which is done, was presented by Van Leer several years ago. So he split them up in this way. And as you will see in a moment, uh, this indeed does give the right uh, values. So I'm going to show you both this one and then on other splitting as well. Okay. So um, here, this is relatively symmetric. So you pulled out this factor here with plus and minus. Okay. And the rest is short of the same. Okay. So uh, it has a rather nice symmetric outlook, if you will. Um, if we do the if you simply write out the equation, uh, you can show that uh, indeed, even though you have, it looks like you've sort of made it, made it more complicated, indeed, uh, this is true. And here I have simply added up the, the uh, terms for the mass conservation, and indeed you can grow you as you should. If you did the same thing for the um, second and third equation, you would indeed be able to show that that is exactly what it is supposed to be. So what is Speed of sound. Okay, so for the 1D flow, these are the uh, these are the fluxes which I've shown you. You can write them actually in terms of Mach numbers, which I have done there. So okay. wherever I have uh, U, I have divided by C. This is Mach numbers, and uh, in for two-dimensional flow, I simply split them in this way, okay? I can split them in different ways, and here's another way of doing that. Right. And you could also, if you wanted to, you can go through and show that indeed this, the sum of those gives you the right fluxes. But these are sort of not as symmetric as the Van Meer fluxes. Uh, so, in any case, uh, in the last few minutes here, I'm going to show you the solution. So I rewrite the fluxes in terms of the back number. Here they are. I, um, here's my equation. 
This is the full equation now written out with the split fluxes, quite a bit more complicated than the original equation. So I solve them with upwind. So basically, uh, I for the plus fluxes, I use j and j minus 1. For the minus fluxes, j plus and j. I here the fluxes again, sorry. So um, the, here's the code. Again, not terribly complicated. And here is the uh, results. Okay. So there are no oscillations here. Okay. That's the good news. The bad news, of course, are that it's a modest, um, modest resolution. It is very huge. Here is several resolutions, and as you can see, the blue one you essentially wash out the shock. The good news is is that when you do the uh, when you do a very fine grid. You get a pretty good solution. You know, that's the green line here. Okay. Uh, the interesting thing is that the shock is actually considerably better represented than the contact, uh, as we have talked about earlier. That is, the shock really wants to be shocked. All the characteristics go into the shock. The contact tends to be the one that washes out more because there's no mechanism to restore. Okay. Okay, so uh, sorry for being a little bit rushed here at the end. I wanted to make sure I got through uh, all of those. Uh, so basically, in this one, we have talked about solutions in one dimension using these two different approaches, lax renders with artificial viscosity and upwind. And uh, on Monday, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, more advanced methods as well as multi-dimension sometime next week. So with that, I think I made it before the end of the lecture.